Now, who is this? Don't get distracted, Snake. You're fighting against Bayonetta, an Umbra Witch. If you don't stay focused, you're toast for sure. Bayonetta? That's a strange name. Her real name is Cereza, but she goes by Bayonetta as well. She took on the name after she lost her memories. Bayonetta is actually the child of an Umbra Witch and a Lumen Sage, a pairing of light and dark that's considered forbidden by both organizations. Forbidden? Uh... Stay focused, Snake! Bayonetta isn't an opponent you can beat if you don't give it your all. She uses her hair to open gateways through which she summons powerful demons. Her four guns are expertly crafted, made by the master weaponsmith Rodan. They're mostly magical, and they put the types of handguns you're used to to shame. I see. Bayonetta's powers also let her transform into animals like bats, and as an Umbra Witch she can also control the flow of time. If you attack her carelessly, She'll activate Witch Time and slow you to a crawl. But her most dangerous trait is her hand-to-hand -hand skills. If you get hit by her, the pain isn't going to stop for a while, so you'd better keep your distance. Sure. Wonder if she'd be interested in going out for some tea. Snake, what did I just tell you? If you get in close, Bayonetta will eat you alive! Snake! What a gaudy way to get around. That would be the Koopa Clown Car, Snake. The signature mode of transportation for the Koopa Kids and their ringleader, Bowser Jr. Bowser Jr.? Bowser as a kid? Indeed, Snake. Bowser Jr. is the son of Bowser and a general in his armies. He fights against Mario to keep him at bay whenever Mario tries to rescue Princess Peach. Talk about nepotism. What about the Koopa Kids? The Koopa Kids are elite fighters in Bowser's army. Normally, they each have a variety of techniques, but in this fight they've all been outfitted with weapons to match their leader. They're a mean bunch of deadly efficient fighters. Are they more of Bowser's kids too? No, but he still treats them like his family. They all get the luxury and accommodations a Koopa could ask for. And it's turned them into a bunch of spoiled brats, is that right? That's correct. But don't confuse arrogance with incompetence. The Koopa Kids and Bowser Jr. have been giving Mario trouble for decades, and they don't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. Excuse me if I'm not feeling honored to fight these loudmouths. How can I beat them? Their clown car is an advanced piece of tech and they have no shortage of gadgets to supplement it. Its drill arms will break through your defenses, and can fire cannonballs from its mouth. They also have explosive Mecha Koopa drones, and can even self-destruct the pod for a last-ditch attack. So what am I meant to do? Their clown car takes reduced damage from attack, but their bodies are vulnerable. Aim your attacks right, and you can send them flying. So... Avoid their traps and aim my attacks carefully. Got it. I'm gonna teach these spoiled soldiers some discipline. Mei Ling, give me a report. Who is this swordsman? That's Krom, Snake. He's the leader of the Shepherds and the ruler of the nation known as Galice. He's a distant descendant of the Euro King Marth. Shepherds? I thought you said he was a ruler, not a sheep farmer. The Shepherds are a security force, an army that fight under the banner of the Exalt, the ruler of Yelis. So, he's a military general. Not quite, Snake. The Shepherds are less an official military force and more a state-sponsored vigilante group. Krom formed them to stop raids on the border of Yelis without risking starting open warfare. Although, that eventually happened anyway. It always seems to be that way. He lost a lot of family to Plesia and its rulers. It's so tragic. But, Krom picked himself back up and ruled with all his effort. He saved Yelise from Plesian forces, and even quelled a military conflict in the nearby nation of Balm. He sounds like the real deal. I assume his sword arm is as sharp as his rule. Krom is actually more of a warrior than a tactician or ruler. He's a bit of a hothead, so after he took the throne, 
He relied a lot on his friends and advisors, but he's never needed to rely on others in a fight. Knowing your own weaknesses is a trait more leaders can benefit from. What should I watch out for on the field? Krom's blade, the falchion, is one of a kind legendary sword. Its blade is balanced, and it'll do its full damage no matter where on the sword you get hit. He can also use an aether, a technique of royalty, so watch out for that. Well, any advice? Krom is dangerous offensively, but on defense he's a little more lacking. If you get the advantage, you should try to press it as much as possible, but be careful he doesn't turn it around on you, Snake. I'm dealing with a bona fide ruler here. I'll be sure to stay on my guard. Otacon, there's a guy out here swinging a massive sword around like it's nothing. That's Cloud, Snake. He's a soldier for the mega corporation Shinra. Him being here right now is a real dream for a lot of people. A soldier? For a corporation? So, private security? Sort of. Shinra uses their private forces like police, security, and a PMC all rolled into one entity. Cloud isn't a member anymore, though. A PMC, huh? Sounds like bad news. Why'd he quit? As far as I can tell, after the destruction of his hometown by a rogue member of Shinra's elite soldier unit named Sephiroth, Cloud just... vanished for a bit. When he came back, he was fighting against Shinra. He was a normal infantryman, but I've heard some people talking about how he's a first-class operative in Soldier. I guess he could have gotten promoted in the time after his official records disappear, but it all seems a bit dubious. That's a real mind-bender, Otacon, but what can you tell me that'll help in the fight? Oh, sorry, Snake. Uh, well, Cloud has undergone some genetic modifications. As you can probably tell, one of the benefits is increased physical strength. Yeah, you're telling me. That sword is the same size he is, but he's swinging it around like it's made of plastic. That's a powerful weapon called the Buster Sword. From my sources, I think it's a hand-me-down from an old friend of his, but I'm not sure. In any case, it's a powerful tool, and a solid hit from it will send you flying. Besides just his sword play, Cloud also has a variety of limit techniques, which are extremely powerful but require him to fill up and spend his limit gauge in order to use them. This is a real dream match, Snake, so go at it with all you have. You and Cloud come from the same place, so give it all you got! Same place? I suppose we're both soldiers, but... Uh, never mind, Snake. I don't think you'd get it anyway. Mei Ling, there's a fighter out here transforming into some kind of dragon. Who is this? That's Corrin, Snake. Corrin is on the succession line to two separate thrones. By blood, to the Kingdom of Light, Hoshido. And by bond, to the Dark Kingdom, Nor. Heir to two thrones, huh? Sounds pretty cushy. It's not, Snake. Oshido and Nor are in constant warfare, and so Korn was forced to make a choice between the two kingdoms. Which one to fight, and which one to join. I can't imagine the kind of pressure that would put on a person. That sounds unfortunate, but don't expect me to slow down just because my opponent has it rough. I don't think that's a concern, Snake. I imagine Korin, more than anyone else, understands that sometimes two people must fight, even if they have an understanding of each other. It's just so tragic, don't you think? Hmm. What can I look out for in the fight? Korin, as the heir to the thrones, possesses dragon's blood. This blood allows them to transform themselves, either partially or fully, into a mythical dragon. Corrin uses this power to supplement their sword techniques, so be ready for transformation. A sword fighter who turns into a dragon. Thanks, Mei Ling. I'll keep an eye out. That's good. Hey, Snake, what would you pick? Hmm? If you had to choose between the family you've always known, or the one you were related to by blood. The one that I've always known. Oh, right. I guess you've already made that choice, huh? 
I just wonder if there couldn't be a third option. Is that Princess Peach? No, Snake. That's Daisy, the Crown Princess of Sarasa Land. A long time ago, she was kidnapped up by an alien named Tatanga. But after Mario saved her, she's ruled in relative peace. So, another princess, huh? She seems more lively. Daisy is a bit of a tomboy. She's a bit more lively and active than Peach is. I hear she's a pretty good tennis player, too. Tennis? Hmm. Maybe when this is all over, we could play a match. I didn't know you played tennis, Snake. I don't. But it could be a pretty good opportunity to learn. Well, maybe if you get good enough, they'll invite you to play the next time they go out for tennis. Or go-karting. Or a party. They do a lot of extracurricular activities in the Mushroom Kingdom. Does Daisy go to those, too? Yep. She's a pretty common figure when Mario and his friends are going on outings. Hey, Snake, you better not be getting any ideas. In a fight, Daisy is just as strong as Peach is, so you'll be in trouble if you have other things on your mind. I just want to come to a mutual understanding. I think she could have some valuable information to give. Okay, Snake. As long as it doesn't go any further than that. But stay focused on your mission, or you'll never get the chance. Understand? Loud and clear. Now, let's see if I can break the ice. <sighs> Is that Pit? Something seems off. That's because you're fighting Dark Pit, Snake. A clone of Pit, created by the Mirror of Truth. A clone? Are you kidding me? Most creatures created by the Mirror of Truth are automatically loyal to the armies of the Underworld. For Dark Pit, however, the mirror was shattered before the process could be completed, which granted him free will. So, is he an enemy or an ally? Neither. He's more of a rival to Pit, who focused on proving himself different from his original. Due to being an exact copy made by the Mirror of Truth, Dark Pit has almost the exact same traits as Pit does. In equipment, though, he has a different loadout than his original, focusing more on all-out offense and power. A clone who's trying to prove he's not like the person he's based on. Ring any bells, Snake. The world makes many mistakes and is slow to correct them. As such, it's inevitable that casualties will occur and people born for no other reason than to fight their masters, for the sake of a cause they don't believe in, will emerge. But the key is not to let your genes define who you are, to fight for what you believe in, regardless of your origins. If you stay true to yourself, then it doesn't matter why you were born. I couldn't have said it better myself, Snake. Now go out there and fight. Make your identity known. Is that Samus? Something seems off. That's not Samus, Snake, so be wary. If you can believe it, that thing is actually the remains of the Metroid Prime, a Metroid that became mutated by Phazon. That thing's a Metroid? Well, it used to be anyway. After Samus destroyed the Metroid Prime, its remains fused with some of her DNA and her suit and became the thing that you're fighting right now. It's known as Dark Samus, and its goal is to spread Phazon throughout the entire galaxy. What exactly is Phazon? Some kind of energy source? Well, sometimes it can be used for that, but Phazon is actually a highly radioactive substance that causes death or mutations in mere seconds after contact. It's also known as the Great Poison, and can corrupt entire planets if left unchecked. Did you say radioactive? Should I even be near this stuff? I don't think Dark Samus gives off enough background radiation to be worried about suffering mutations. But don't breathe easy just yet, Snake. Dark Samus has all the same techniques and moves as Samus does, so it's a highly dangerous creature. Its weapons are also powered by Phazon energy, which gives it incredible power. Keep on your toes or else you'll end up blasted by its Phazon beam. 
radioactive weaponry on an infantry-sized combatant. It sends shivers down my spine too, Snake. But stay focused! Dark Samus is a menace on the galaxy, so if you don't stop it now, there's no telling the damage it'll do. Understood. I'll stop it here and now. Otacon. Mario's standing in front of me, but he's dressed kind of weird. That's Dr. Mario Snake. He worked hard to get that title, so show him some respect. Birds of a feather, huh? But isn't Mario a plumber? Are you sure he has the credentials to work in a hospital? Does he even have a PhD? Ah, uh, well, his methods are a little unorthodox, for sure. But he's managed to battle and defeat many viruses that the rest of the medical world had no idea how to cure. So, I should be watching out for him trying to heal me, then. Hardly sounds like a fighting strategy. Don't underestimate him, Snake. He's stronger and tougher than Mario is by a mile, and his special medicine can hurt more than just viruses. Plus, he has the analytical mind of a man of science. It's gonna take everything you have to get past him. Just whose side are you on, Otacon? What? Your side, of course. I'm just saying, you're gonna be in trouble if you take an accomplished scientist like Dr. Mario as a joke. But isn't he still just Mario? Sounds to me like someone's a little bit obsessed. Otacon! I'm fighting against the dog from Duck Hunt! What should I do? Duck Hunt? I'm surprised you recognized him, Snake. Duck Hunt was originally an arcade game created in 1976, but its most famous release was on the NES, where it was packaged with the original Super Mario Bros. It used light-detecting sensors in the barrel of a toy gun to detect whether or not your aim was correct. The NES Zapper, a wonderful piece of tech. Duck Hunt this time around seems to have brought a Zapper along with him too. I noticed. I'm getting pelted out here. Watch out for the aiming reticles, Snake. They're a sign of the Zapper being fired on your location. Duck Hunt isn't just here representing his own game either, but a plethora of classic NES Zapper titles. That explosive can is from Hogan's Alley, and those outlaws he's summoning are from wild gunmen, right? That's right. How do you know all of this, Snake? The NES Zapper was the original VR training kit. It proved useful as a tool for learning proper hand-eye coordination techniques. I used it a lot in off time for training, before they developed all that fancy VR stuff. Oh, so it was for training. Is something wrong, Otacon? No, no. I just thought... Never mind. Just don't let Duck Hunt dictate the flow of the fight. If you lose control to him, it might be the end of the line for you. Understood. I'll show that dog who's laughing now. Otacon, there's some kind of frog out here. I can barely follow its movements. That's Greninja, Snake. It's a water-type Pokemon from the Kalos region. Greninja uses highly compressed water to fight. Usually, it forms this water into shurikens to throw at opponents, but it can form them into many different weapons and tools. When it uses its full force, this water can even cut through steel, so be sure to watch out. Seems pretty strong if it can do all that with just water. What about its movements? Greninja styles itself like a ninjutsu master. Aside from hand-to-hand -hand skills, Greninja can also hide its true form in shadows for a surprise attack and substitute itself out for a counterattack in the blink of an eye. A self-styled ninja, huh? Reminds me of someone I know. These techniques seem like they'd be in your wheelhouse, Otacon. Any idea how to get past its ninjutsu? My wheelhouse? What do you mean by that, Snake? I wasn't the one who developed Ray's high-pressure water cutters. No, it just seemed like it fit in your interests. Uh, never mind. Forget I said anything. Is there anything else I should watch out for? Okay. Well, this Greninja seems to have formed a special bond of friendship with its trainer. That bond might allow it to transform and unleash a powerful attack. If you start to see it change its appearance, get out of there fast. Bond of friendship, huh? Kind of like what you and me have, Snake. Heh. <laughs> well, call me back when that friendship will let me transform, Otacon. Hey, no need to be rude. 
I don't like the look of this one, Otacon. Huh? But that's just Incineroar, Snake. Incineroar is a Pokemon, but he's also a professional wrestler. He fights with a lot of grappling moves like suplexes and body slams. He's slow, but his strength is massive. What's up with this guy's ego? He's taking a break to pose after every attack! Like I said, Snake, Incineroar is a wrestler. He's probably just playing to the crowd or something. He's got a pretty devoted fan base, too. Fan base? Look at him, Otacon! He doesn't respect anyone else in this fight! I mean, he is the heel, Pokemon, Snake. Heel? What's that supposed to mean? Snake, don't you know that it's all just... You don't know? Don't know what? I'll tell you what I do know. A smug fighter like this deserves to be beaten down a peg, whether they've got a fan base or not. Uh, well, I hear that Incineroar cares a lot about his fans, signs autographs and such, so maybe he's, uh, not too bad? <sighs> he's just rewarding people who feed into his ego trip. Now I'm not gonna fall for it. Is there something you're not telling me, Otacon? Uh, no, no. Just don't think that ego is for nothing. Incineroar has many powerful moves like his darkest lariat, and he can force you to run the ropes with his Alolan whip. It's okay to be passionate, Snake. Just, uh, don't go too hard, okay? He's just a guy doing his job. Doing his job? What's that supposed to mean? And, uh, try not to take anything too personally, okay, Snake? My camouflage! Mei Ling, I'm being attacked by anti-stealth units! Um, anti-stealth units? Those are just Inklings, Snake. Inklings are squid-human hybrids who fight using special ink to mark territory and harm opponents. So, this is just ink, then? I was getting worried. Hopefully it washes off. Don't rest easy just yet, Snake. The ink will naturally fade after a while. But, if you get hit while it's stuck on you, you'll take increased damage from the attack. If you get covered, retreat and try to rest a bit. Understood. Anything else I should know? The Inkling species is in constant conflict with a race of sentient octopus-like creatures called the Octarians. In the past, many great wars were fought between the two factions. In modern times, Reenactments of battles in this war evolved into the most popular pastime of the Inklings, the Turf War. So they're a species that plays war games for fun? Don't say it like that, Snake. The Turf Wars may have come from warfare, but they've evolved into a sport like any other. Even the Inklings and Octolines have been able to find common ground and form friendships by participating in Turf Wars. Do they have any other interests besides these combat exercises? Clothing, music, normal stuff like that. Don't get too comfy though, Snake. Even though it's become a game instead of warfare, Inklings still go through combat training scenarios the same way you or me would play to soccer or tennis. Their aimings, tactics, and battle sense are probably going to be a bit more advanced than what you would think so don't let it get you caught off guard. Stay safe out there, and don't get splatted, Snake! Splatted? Is that dog wearing a suit? That's Isabel, Snake. She's the hard-working assistant to the mayor. The assistant mayor is a talking dog? I guess you must be hard-working. That's right. The mayor is a bit eccentric, so Isabel does a lot of the work around the town. I guess she's taking some time off to come out here? This is no vacation spot, it's a battlefield! I guess not everyone sees the world the same way you do, Snake. Getting to see all these legends in action. For some people, I bet that would make a great vacation. A civilian's gonna get eaten alive out here. Are you sure this is a good idea? I wouldn't worry too much if I were you, Snake. Isabel is pretty multi-talented. She packed a fishing rod and an exploding gyroid, and she uses them to great effect. I think she'll be fine out here. <sighs> it's nice you're worried, though, Snake. You've got a good heart.
I just don't want civilians to be in a dangerous area like this without proper safety, that's all. Are you sure, Snake? Maybe you could use this opportunity to take this more as an adventure than a battle, like Isabel is. Find some time and talk to people. She might know who you are. I don't know about that. I doubt there's much to talk about. Unless... Huh? Do you think she knows anything about sledding? You really have no idea about dogs, do you, Snake? I don't like the look of this guy, Colonel. That overgrown crocodile is King K. Rule, the undisputed ruler of the humanoid reptile race known as the Kremlin. I've heard about this guy. That's no surprise, Snake. He's made a lot of waves in the past. What do you know? He's a wild animal, with an ego even bigger than his own body. He rules the Kremlin with an iron fist, regularly tries to raid the Kong's banana horde, and he keeps coming back no matter how many times he's pummeled. All that is very true, Snake. A king so cruel it's written in his name. Watch out for his crown. It's a dangerous weapon when thrown. But if you can grab it or otherwise stop the king from getting it back, he'll be without it for a while. So, that'll lock him out of long-range attacks, then? Not quite. K. Rule can also don his pirate hat and his blunderbuss and turn into his Captain K. Rule persona to fire from long range. So, he's a captain now, too? Just how many titles does this lizard have? Never underestimate the vanity that unopposed rule will present. K. Rule isn't all talk, unfortunately. He's so tough he can take hits without even flinching. If he does it too much, though, his belly will shatter and provide an opportunity for a counterattack. Understood. I'm gonna knock this king down a few pegs. I'm with you, Snake. Show that overgrown ego trip who the superior reptile is. Snake, watch out! Ken Master's fire will burn you alive! Huh? Who is this? Identify yourself! Unlike you, I have no name. If you don't focus on the fight, you're not going to last, Snake. Avoid can sure you can. On top of being strong, it'll light you on fire. Keep your distance. Answer my question! Who are you? Why are you calling me? If you want an answer, Snake, look to your opponent. A pair of lifelong rivals, trained by the same man. Though their lives went down different paths, they are destined to cross fists forever. Ryu and Ken. You and me, Snake. What? But that's... It can't be! Powerful kicks, martial arts skill, burning passion. Don't lose before I can find you, Snake. Where are you? Where are you right now? I'm close, Snake. Very close. I'm coming to find you, Snake. Where are you? Answer me! He disconnected. He's here too? Fox. Jaeger. I can't lose now. Snake, do you know who you're fighting right now? The gloves. That stance. The height. It has to be Little Mac, right? That's right, Snake. Little Mac is a professional boxer and a competitor in the World Video Boxing Association, or WVBA. He became WVBA champion by winning the title off the previous holder, Mr. Sandman. I saw those tapes. Despite being dwarfed in size, Little Mac threw punch after punch with incredible power and evaded his opponent with precise footwork. He brought that giant down in three rounds. I need to be careful. You sure do, Snake. Little Mac's fists are lethal weapons, and his KO punch will send any opponent flying, no matter how big they are. His footwork is lightning fast, too, and he can weave in and out of his range. That sounds dire. And that's not all. Even if you do manage to get a hit in, Little Mac has the endurance and tenacity to take the hit without flinching or stopping his assault. No matter how you slice it, Mac is a boxing legend. He was born in the Bronx and trained by the famous Doc Lewis. The Doc Lewis? 
Hmm. If I beat Little Mac here, I wonder if Doc will teach me how to box. Are you going to shoot for the WVBA championship, Snake? Then this fight will be a good chance for you to see a master in action. And if you do manage to make it into the association, I'll be in your corner all the way, Snake. Yeah! Let's do it, Otacon! Is that Marth? Something seems a little... different. Not quite, Snake, but you're close. That's Lucina, a distant descendant of Marth. She comes from a ruined future. A ruined future? In her time, the fell dragon Grima destroyed the world and killed her family. Lucina and her friends went to the past to stop that from happening, through a rift in time. Stop that from happening? But that would create a time paradox! But it's true, Snake! The proof of it is her sword, the Parallel Falchion. It's a one-of-a-kind weapon of legend, but both her and her father wield it. She and her friends fought alongside their parents to defeat the fell dragon before its plans could be finished. So she saved her future? No. She saved the future of her parents' timeline, but... But her own world didn't change at all, huh? She and her friends set to repairing their world, but they couldn't bring their parents back from the dead. It's so sad. What can I expect from the fight? Sorry. Okay, Lucina fights very similarly to her ancestor Marth, so much so that she even impersonated the Hero King for a while. However, Though the sword she wields is the same sword as Marth's, over time it was reforged significantly. Unlike Marth's falchion, hers deals the same damage all the way through the blade. Uh, first you tell me that her and Marth are both here, despite her being a distant descendant, and now you're telling me she's a time traveler on top of that? Don't let it get to your head, Snake. Lucina is a very driven swordswoman, so, if you get distracted in battle, she'll beat you for sure. Focus on the fight ahead of you. Got it. Whoa, Snake, watch out. That's Mega Man you're fighting against. Mega Man? Mega Man is a robot developed by the genius roboticist Dr. Thomas Light. His original name was Rock, and he was a house cleaning robot. But when the evil Dr. Wily threatened world peace, he was upgraded with super fighting capabilities. A super fighting robot? Like a Metal Gear? Uh, not quite, Snake. Mega Man is one of the first partially free-thinking robots, and he has a heart that fights on the side of justice. He's not some war machine to be piloted. Besides, don't you think he's a little small to be a Metal Gear? <sighs> Tactically sized, and with artificial intelligence? I see. So he's like a gecko. I think you have the wrong idea about robots, Snake. Mega Man possesses a long-range energy gun on his arm, but his most notable ability is that he can take the weapons from other robots that he destroys. He's got metal buzz saws, razor-sharp leaves, and adhesive explosive devices. I'd say he might even be more equipped than you are, Snake. A robot who can copy other robots' weapons. I see. Otacon. What type of weaponry do you think he'd get if he destroyed a Metal Gear? A Metal Gear? Well, if it was Rex, it would probably either be its magnetic railgun or its high-energy lasers. If it was a Ray model, then he might end up with its high-pressure water cutter. Sounds dangerous. That kind of weaponry on that small of a machine. I'll take him out before he can become a threat. Oh, Snake. Colonel, there's a strange humanoid creature teleporting around out here. That's Mewtwo. It's a highly dangerous Pokemon with nearly unmatched psychic abilities. Psychic abilities? Hmm, reminds me of old times. That's not all, Snake. Mewtwo is also a genetic clone of Mew, a unique Pokemon that is said to have the DNA of every other Pokemon within itself. A clone? Les enfants terribles? Not quite. 
but Mewtwo was the result of a similar program. He was designed to be a genetic weapon, and his powers exceed even that of the Pokémon he was based on. He was trained from birth to achieve this psychic strength. He has intelligence that dwarfs most humans, but despite that, he was still subjected to horrible conditions. It traumatized him, and he grew to resent humanity because of it. <sighs> Snake, I know it's hard. You must be one of the few people alive who can understand what Mewtwo has been through, but you can't let that distract you. I understand, Colonel. The battlefield isn't forgiving enough for me to make it if I get caught on these hang-ups. I'm glad, Snake. And one more thing. Huh? No matter what you might think, or what your origins are, neither you or Mewtwo are just machines of war. You're your own people. Don't lose sight of that. Thank you, Colonel. Colonel, there's some weird plastic-looking people jumping around down here. Those are me fighters, Snake. They're artificial humanoids. Me fighters come in three varieties, swordsmen, brawlers, and gunners. And each of those types has a wide array of different techniques that they can choose from. Artificial humanoids? But why would somebody make those? And what's with all the variations? It's combat training. Me fighters are designed to have a wide variety of moves to act as training dummies and sparring partners for people looking to improve their skills. They're also designed to be able to look like any person their creator wishes them to. So, they're a bunch of crash test dummies? This shouldn't be much of a fight. I wouldn't be so sure if I were you, Snake. Most me fighters follow a completely automatic programming, but the ones you're fighting against seem to be showing unique traits. I think there's a chance they may have somehow evolved into fully sapient fighters, growing from their roots as simple sparring partners. They're likely as dangerous as anyone else you'll meet on the field. That sounds like trouble. Any idea why? Don't ask me, Snake. I'm as lost as you are on this phenomenon. Maybe while you're fighting, you can find the answer yourself. I see. Colonel, you said they could look like anyone the creator wanted them to look like, right? Do you think there are me fighters out there who look like me? Or you? I can't deny the possibility. That's great. Just what I needed. More clones and lookalikes. I think you would need to do a lot more than grow out your hair to be confused with a me fighter, Snake. Snake, do you know who you're fighting right now? You're kidding, right? That's Pac-Man! That's right, Snake. Not much of a question, huh? Pac-Man made his debut in the arcade machine of the same name in the year 1980, and since then has gone down in legend as one of video games' most recognizable characters. Seeing him here like this really brings me back to the good old days. And he's not alone, either. He's brought along relics from some other classic games, like Galaga and Mappy. It's a real showcase of the arcade classics. Duking it out like this with a living legend really makes you think. Hey, don't forget, Snake. You're a legend too, you know. War doesn't make legends, Otacon. I think you're too hard on yourself, Snake. It's never too late to change for the better. Take Pac-Man. He's a legend because of the happiness that he's given to people over the years. He wasn't just given that legacy, he earned it for himself. If you don't want to be remembered for war, then it's not too late to make yourself known for joy. Being remembered for enriching people's lives. It's a noble goal, Snake. I think more people in the world could learn from Pac-Man. Besides, I know for a fact you've got a head start. You've already made so many people's lives better, Snake. Thank you, Otacon. Green hair, regal staff, divine aura. Yep, that's the goddess of light, all right. <sighs> Who is this? You're not the colonel. How did you get on this frequency? Nice observation, pal. You're right. I'm not your commander. The name's Magnus. I'm a warrior, and I've dealt with your opponent before. What? Why are you calling now? That little goddess over there has been feeding information on every fighter here to her little angel pal. So I figured I'd even the playing field a bit for us mortals. Goddess? 
Are you saying she isn't human? You're catching on. That over there is Palutena, benevolent ruler of Angel Land and goddess of light. Normally, she's pretty content to sit around all day and ignore the plights of humans, so I'm a little surprised she's out here fighting instead of sending her errand boy. So, she tends to avoid battles, huh? Is she even a fighter? Fighter? I'd like to say no, but fact is, she's still got some pretty impressive magical powers. She normally grants them to Angel Face, but I imagine she's probably going to use them herself here. She can counter attacks, send your projectiles back at you, summon explosive fire, short range homing attacks. Plus, she can make beams of light, manifest angel wings in her back to strike at long range. Basically, anything and everything she can do to make herself a pain to deal with. I never thought I'd be battling against a goddess out here. It's not so bad once you get used to it. I'm sure I'll manage. I faced tougher before. Now that's the kind of thing I like to hear. Get out there, show that prissy little god what it means to be a human. Snake, hold on. Mei Ling, what is it? You're fighting Pichu right now, aren't you? Pichu? You mean that yellow rat over there? <laughs> Pichu is not a rat, Snake. It's a Pokemon. Pichu is the most unevolved form of Pikachu. Basically, it's what a Pikachu looks like before it grows up. It's got most of the same powers and abilities, but... Yeah? What is it? Pichu is pretty inexperienced, so it can't fully handle its electric powers. While it's fighting you, it's probably also hurting itself with electricity. I feel so bad for the little guy. A fighter who can't handle its own power, huh? Seems like this will be easy. Maybe, but you still have to be careful, Snake. Pichu may be weaker than Pikachu, but it's aware of its weakness, so it'll fight you with every ounce of energy it has to make up the difference. Tenacious, huh? You have to be pretty strong to be willing to go all out at that big of a disadvantage. I'm sure it'll grow into a fine warrior someday. Yeah, and Snake, one more thing. What is it, Mei Ling? Do you think you can catch him for me? Please? I'll see what I can do. Otacon, what's this strange plant-like creature? That's a piranha plant, Snake. It's a carnivorous and sentient plant. The piranha plant made its debut in the original Super Mario Bros. and has been a regular nuisance to Mario and Luigi since then. Up there with the Goomba and the Koopa Troopa. Nuisance? Seems a little harsh. It's a soldier doing its job. Blame its king, not the plant itself. Uh, it's just a plant, Snake. Although originally all the piranha plant could do was emerge from its pipe to try and bite at Mario, over time it learned a lot of tricks. It can spit out clouds of poison, toss out sharp spiked balls, and spin itself like a propeller to fly. I see... I'll keep my distance and scope out the target. Are you sure, Snake? That seems a little unnecessary. Take it from someone who knows, Otacon. No soldier lasts as long as the piranha plant has without having some serious tricks up its sleeves. Um, okay, I guess. Oh, it can also call in backup from an elder member of the piranha plant family, Petey Piranha. If that happens, just avoid his cages and you should be fine. See? What did I tell you, Otacon? Those are the types of tactics you get from a veteran of war. Well, whatever you say, Snake. It's an honor to do battle with an elder statesman like this. I feel like you're taking this a bit too seriously. Otacon, nothing I do is connecting. I can't get in. That's no surprise. You're fighting against Richter Belmont, Snake arguably the most powerful member in the entire Belmont clan of Vampire Slayers. Richter made his debut in Rondo of Blood. After Dracula was resurrected by dark priests in 1792, they kidnapped maidens from nearby villages to be used as sacrifice in further dark rituals. One of those girls was Annette, Richter's girlfriend. After receiving the news, he leapt into action against Dracula's dark forces. Going up against a dark army to save the woman he loved. Sounds like a stand-up guy. 
by all accounts, Richter is a kind warrior of justice. Don't let that fool you into thinking he's soft, though. Richter single-handedly destroyed Dracula's dark army, plus his followers and elite generals. He supplements the Belmont's universal training with the whip, with intense martial arts techniques. His highly damaging uppercut, a smooth and evasive sliding kick, combined with his mastery of subweapons, like the nigh-unimpossible-to-escape burn of the holy water, and it's easy to see why he's regarded as the strongest of all the Belmonts. Weapons mastery, martial arts training, a lineage of combat, and a heart of justice. This is going to be a tough fight, Otacon. Sort of reminds me of someone else I know, Snake. Huh? I won't deny that it'll be a tough battle, but don't think you're out of it yet. Richter is strong, but he's still just a man like you or me. Get your hits in where you can, and I know you'll be able to pull through. Thanks for the pep talk, Otacon. I'll try not to let you down. You never have before, Snake. I've got a bad feeling about this one, Colonel. I can't say I blame you, Snake. Your opponent is Ridley, the brutal leader of the Space Pirates. Space Pirates? They're a group of raiders and criminals, the scourge of the galaxy at large. Ridley is the leader of the organization, and its most dangerous member. He was also the killer of Samus's parents, and a long-time foe of hers ever since. The way he's slashing with his claws, he's like a wild animal. Don't let that fool you, Snake. Ridley is as intelligent as he is cruel. He fights like that not because he knows no other ways, but because he's determined it the most efficient way to eradicate his opponents. Ridley uses his sharp talons, teeth, and tail, along with his surprising speed and overwhelming size and strength, to destroy his foes without any mercy. He was born for this kind of combat. I've taken down opponents bigger than me before, but none that are that fast. Ridley is also extremely durable. No matter how many times he's been blasted, burned, or destroyed, he always hangs on to torment the galaxy a little bit more, whether it be via cybernetic implants or clones created by people who wanted to harness his strength. Do you think you can handle it, Snake? Ridley's not the only one here who has cunning on his side. I'll manage, Colonel. That's the spirit, Snake. Few have faced down Ridley and lived to tell the tale. Now it's your turn to put your name on that list. Colonel! I'm getting pelted by strange attacks! That would be Robin, then. Robin is the child of the leader of a religious sect known as the Grim Lael. They're also the reincarnation of that sect's god, the Fell Dragon Grima. Fell Dragon? But they'd look just like a normal person! Indeed, Snake. Robin lost their memories for a time, and was recruited by the Prince of Yelise while suffering from amnesia. Yelise is a country that was at tense conflict with the home nation of the Grim Lael, Plagia. So, they turned against their own nation? That's right, Snake. By the bonds they formed with the Prince and his allies, Robin rejected their fate as the Fell Dragon, and fought to stop the Grim Lael once and for all. <sighs> what is it, Snake? Nothing, Colonel. So, Robin isn't going to be transforming into this fell dragon, then? Correct, but don't think you can get cocky. Despite not tapping into their dark powers, Robin is still an extremely talented mage, with a variety of magic tomes to use, like Arc Fire and Thoron. Besides just magic, though, Robin is also adept with a blade. Watch out for their Levin Sword. It's a blade infused with magical energy and packs a massive punch. This sounds like it's going to be impossible. Don't give up just yet, Snake. Robin's tomes and Levin sword are powerful, but they can only be used so many times. Pay attention to how many attacks they're using, and when they toss them away, if you can catch them without their weaponry, you'll have a massive advantage. <sighs> I see. Thanks for the tip, Colonel. No problem, Snake. Now get out there and show Robin that neither of you are locked by fate. Mei Ling, I'm taking hits from all sides! So you're fighting against Rosalina and Luma then? 
Be careful, Snake. Those two are a pair to be reckoned with. Rosalina and Luma. Which one is which? Rosalina is the princess holding the wand. So that would make the weird star thing Luma then. Don't be rude, Snake. Lumas are creatures from deep space. They eat star bits, and when they get older, transform into celestial bodies, like comets and planets. Transforming into a planet? That's ridiculous! It's true, Snake. This one seems to be pretty young, though, so you shouldn't have to worry about him transforming in the middle of a fight. The Lumas tell many stories, like the one about a young girl who went on a voyage with a silver Luma to find his mother. But, as they traveled, the young girl took on a motherly role for the Lumas herself, constructing a beautiful comet observatory in the sky. Telling stories, huh? Seems like you'd get along with them well, Mei Ling. So, the girl who became the Lumas' mother, that's Rosalina. I'm not sure, Snake, but what's for certain is that Rosalina and her Lumas have a bond that is nothing to mess with. The way they work together and cooperate, their synchronicity, it's something that can only be accomplished with a bond of family. Family, huh? Snake, is something wrong? It's nothing. I'll be sure to stay on my toes. If you say so, Snake. Colonel, who's that red-haired swordsman? That's Roy, Snake. Heir to the throne of Ferre. People have been clamoring for his return to the fight. Back by request, huh? Roy hails from the land of Elibe. His father, Eliwood, is the Marquis of Ferre, one of the 14 noble houses to make up the Lycian League. When the nation of Bern began an all-out offensive on his homeland, Roy joined the armies of Ferre and the neighboring kingdoms to defend against them in his father's absence despite his youth. So, he's a child soldier, then. I need to be careful not to hurt him too much. Not just a soldier, Snake. He was a commander. Roy is a talented swordsman, and has a keen mind for military strategy. You'd best stay on your toes. I see. And what about the sword? It's no ordinary sword. That's the Binding Blade, one of the weapons of legend wielded by the eight heroes in a war between humans and dragons known as the Scouring. Between humans and dragons, huh? Must be a pretty strong sword. More than you can imagine. The eight weapons of legend were said to be so strong that their use caused a calamity that brought the world into chaos. The Binding Blade in particular harnesses the power of fire. It's strongest near the hilt of the blade, so Roy tends to get in close with his attacks to unleash its full force. A noble prince who likes to get scrappy, huh? Seems like a weird kid. Roy is good-natured at heart, but out on the battlefield, don't expect him to hesitate, Snake. He's a pure warrior, through and through, and he'll fight to defend himself and his kingdom. I wouldn't have it any other way, Colonel. Colonel, there's a really intense guy out here. That's Ryu, Snake. He was the winner of the first ever World Warrior Tournament, and a mainstay at them ever since. World Warrior Tournament. It was a street fighting tournament with participants from all across the planet, wasn't it? You're well informed. Ryu battled through many tough opponents and defeated them all, culminating in a final win against Muay Thai Master Sagat. Ryu was trained by Master Goken in a modified style of Anatsuken, or the Assassination Fist. Assassination Fist? That sounds like it's going to be trouble. Though the version Ryu was taught was a non-lethal variant, there's no doubt it's still a dangerous style. Aside from the myriad of martial arts moves Ryu has learned, the Anatsuken is home to a number of non-standard but extremely dangerous techniques. By channeling his life energy, Ryu can shoot a fireball from his hands called a Hadoken. At close range, he can perform a massively powerful leaping uppercut called a Shoryuken. If he needs to get in close, he can fly through the air with a spinning whirlwind kick called the Tatsumaki Senpu Kyaku. Long range, close range, and a way to travel between the two. He seems like an incredibly versatile fighter. Indeed, Snake. From his techniques to his mindset, 
Ryu may just be the ultimate fighter. There are many who have tried to imitate his skills, but there will only ever be one world warrior. You'd best stay on your toes. Understood, Colonel. Over and out. What's going on? I can't get a single hit in! Snake, stay calm. Right now you're fighting against Shulk, the wielder of the Monado. Shulk is from Colony 9, a settlement on top of the massive titan called Bionis. His settlement was attacked by the enemies of Bionis, mechanical lifeforms called Mechons. That sword he wields, the Monado, is the only weapon capable of damaging Mechons. So it's a sword used to fight robots? That sounds useful. Don't get too excited, Snake. The Monado can only be wielded by certain people. For most people who try to fight with it, it'll just drain their life energy. Ah, well, that's a shame. Could have been useful. But why aren't my attacks landing? Besides being able to harm Mechons, the Monado gives its wielder various other powers and abilities. One of those is Foresight, the ability to get a limited glimpse into the future. Ah, to see the future? Well, that would explain it. How do I beat something like that? Should I try changing my controller port? I don't think that'll work in this fight, Snake. Besides, Shulk isn't reading your mind. The Monado tells him where every particle in the world is going to be for a few seconds. But it's not invincible, Snake. The Monado can't see into the future forever, so you can get some hits in when Shulk can't see it coming. Besides Foresight, the Monado also allows Shulk to change his attributes through a variety of Monado arts. He's a very versatile fighter, so you'll have to stay on your toes. I see. Sounds like a pretty good piece of tech. Are you sure I won't be able to wield it? Well, they say the Monado can only be wielded by those with an exceptional amount of willpower. It's risky, but I guess there's a chance. But you'll never find out if you don't win this fight, Snake, so go all out! Is that guy using a whip to fight? That's Simon Belmont, Snake, and that whip is a holy weapon known as the Vampire Killer. You can probably guess from that, but Simon Belmont is a vampire hunter, a member of the illustrious Belmont clan. Vampire hunter? Are you sure? That seems a little ridiculous. Tell that to Simon. As a child, he grew up hearing stories about his predecessors, like Trevor and Christopher, the previous holders of the legendary whip Vampire Killer. He grew up eager to test his own skills against his ancestry, and in the year 1691, he got his long-awaited chance when Dracula revived again. Growing up, anticipating a calamity for a chance to fight? That's reckless. He fought through Castlevania, Dracula's stronghold, slaying hundreds of the Dark Lord's minions, and eventually triumphing over Dracula himself. But that recklessness caught up to him when he failed to avoid a deadly curse Dracula put on his body. Deadly curse? So how's he standing around here now? After a wise woman told him of the curse, Simon began a quest to retrieve the scattered pieces of Dracula's corpse, which were being used to summon monsters which terrorized the people on the countryside. After reviving the pieces of the corpse, Simon resurrected Dracula himself, and slayed him a second time, freeing himself from the curse and the townspeople from the plague of monsters that stalked the night. He was practically regarded as a hero, and retired peacefully amid support from all those around him. He seems like a folk hero. I'm honored to fight him. You should be, Snake. Simon is a proud warrior, and has conquered many impossible obstacles. He can angle the striking of his whip to attack at multiple angles, and carries a variety of sub-weapons with him, like the boomerang cross or the powerful axe. If you can't overcome his barrage of attacks, you'll have no chance of taking him out. He's not the only one who's armed to the teeth, Colonel. I'll match his barrage with one of my own. That sounds like a plan, Snake. Execute it well, and you might just go down in history as the man who defeated Simon Belmont. Mei Ling, there's a person out here who's taking all my weapons! That's the villager, Snake. They're a person who lives amongst animals, in small villages. I think this one comes from the town of Smashville. 
Lives among animals, huh? Like huskies? I don't think it's quite like that. They use a lot of unorthodox weaponry as well. Boxing gloves, slingshots, turnips, balloons. Don't forget all of my grenades, too. The villager lives a pretty carefree life in town, working for markets and collecting bugs. I'm surprised that they're fighting out here like this. People fight for a lot of reasons, Mei Ling. A home to go back to is a common one. I guess. Maybe you should move to that town, Snake. I know you could use the company. No can do. I appreciate quiet too much. Besides, not sure how well I could get along living with a bunch of talking animals. But I'm sure your dogs would love it. Besides, you've already got the perfect name. <sighs> Colonel, there's someone out here exercising in the middle of the fight. That's the Wii Fit Trainer. They're fully dedicated to training their body, and they've made a career out of helping others to do the same. But to keep training, even on the battlefield? I admit it takes guts, but... Never underestimate that kind of mental fortitude, Snake. The Wii Fit Trainer is in this battle to make themselves stronger. The unorthodox fighting techniques they've developed aren't made to defeat their opponents, but to strengthen their own bodies as much as possible. You're telling me I can barely tell whether they're even trying to hit me or not? You could learn a thing or two from them, Snake. And what's that supposed to mean? I don't suppose you have the time to get much exercise in when you're dog-mushing, do you? I get by! You never know when you're gonna need to fight. Maybe I should take some notes on their form. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to help. And besides, understanding how they move will give me an edge in battle. That's thinking with your head, Snake. Now get moving. Run. I don't want a slow soldier on my payroll. Since when are you a drill sergeant, Colonel? Watch out, Snake. You're fighting against young Link. Young Link? Yes, Young Link. It's basically Link as he was when he was a child. A reincarnation of the Hero of Legend. Hero of Legend? But he's just a kid. Don't underestimate him, Snake. Even though he's a child, Young Link was still able to accomplish many amazing feats. He defended the Great Deku Tree from the spider demon Goma, saved the Gorons and their homes from the great beast Dodongo, and defeated the parasitic monster Baronade within Lord Jabu Jabu's stomach. Those are some impressive accomplishments for a little kid. What should I look out for on the battlefield? Young Link still fights similarly to his adult form, but he has a few different tricks up his sleeves. The tips of his arrows are coated in fire, and he wields a long-range hookshot, which he uses for grabbing opponents. Plus, he's fast, be careful not to get caught, Snake. That is impressive. But if he's rushing headfirst into the fight, then I know I haven't beat in terms of pure experience in battle. I think so too, Snake. Use that advantage to outposition him as best you can. I'm gonna give that kid a lesson in respecting his elders. Just don't go too hard on him, okay, Snake? He's still just a child. Hardly. If it's his destiny to grow up into the hero of legend, then it's my duty to teach him as much as I can in battle. He'll need all the help he can get when the time comes for him to step up. I'm doing him a favor. I... see. Well, then, good luck, Snake. Just try not to overdo it, okay? <laughs> 